Welcome to Real Physics. Now, particle physics is becoming a ridiculous enterprise by demanding another huge tax by your funded collider. So I gave a talk on this on the recent meeting of the German Physical Society and commented also on one of the most preposterous talks given the day before. What I didn't know was that the author of this paper was the chairman of my session. Watch. Yeah, welcome everybody to my talk. So the title of my talk is Do we need a new collider? And to be clear up front, the answer is no. So I give you a chance to leave the conference room. If you disagree with my message, it might be somehow hard to swallow. And I will start with three observations, three points, and these are, I will of course strongly argue against the necessity, but take this just as a benevolent advice from an outsider, how you should not advertise the necessity of a new collider. Number one, refrain from cartoonishly talking bold. Oh, we are going to unravel the secrets of, of the universe, by the way, why don't you always take all these galaxy pictures? It's not your work. You kind of abuse other people's research for promoting your case. I don't think this is okay. And then you have this comics of, uh, was a recent talk at the, at the DPG. And the superhero, the Hicks, and explains our existence. We would all be annihilated if it doesn't exist. No, I mean, sorry, the public won't be willing to pay $20 billion for a comics playbook. And this is number one. Number two, think about who is supporting you. I mean, you can ask people like Nima Akami Hamid why we need a new collider. And he will say, we should build the new collider because we can. We need to figure out what is particle physics? We need to figure out what is physics. We need to figure out what is a particle. So my advice is distance yourself from crazy theorists. String theory is not science and you know that pretty well. Number three, don't make a fool out of yourself. The no-lose theorem of particle physics. What's that? I've never heard such a nonsense in a scientific conference. What, that, this is at the level of Anselm of Canterbury's proof of the existence of God. What does that mean? No lose, we cannot lose. I mean, everybody has probably a lot of flowing money, but this is precisely what I want to uh, uh, challenge here. The attitude of, we will discover something fantastic, a ultimate confirmation of the standard model. It will be vindicated. It will be wonderful. Either, or if not, well, we will discover something even more exciting beyond the standard model. I mean, this beyond is kind of a misnomer. I mean, in science, you have either it's correct, it's wrong. You don't have beyond, OK? So, uh, I would rather propose here a no-use theorem of particle physics. The FCC results will be either seen as a corroboration of an excessively complicated model or taken as a hint, clue, or smoking gun for even a more nonsensical extension such as SUSY, as every thinkable experimental anomaly will be digested by a talk hypothesis but by design, never, never seen as a refutation of the model. And of course, this is the death of falsifiability. But in one respect, I cannot blame you. That's precisely what you were rewarded for by the Nobel Committee, because in 2013, we have this milestone for particle physics and a tremendous success for the standard model, because the Higgs verified the standard model. And then two years later, we had another major milestone for particle physics showing the incompleteness of the standard model. That means the standard model is wrong. So I don't get this 
or William Doublespeak 2013, you get a Nobel for, oh, the standard model is fantastic, it's, it's true, 2015, no, it's wrong, so what do you want? Okay, um, the only logical conclusion to draw from these two Nobel Prizes is that the standard model is crap, which doesn't come as a surprise if you take a look at it. And of course you say, no, okay, it's the best crap we have, it's the only crap we have, it's a very useful crap. No, we are in the midst of epicycles here, and you should recognize this. Why is, why is this epicycle like? Well, I have mentioned in other talks the seven deadly sins of particle physics. I'm going to briefly summarize this. You have this overwhelming complication of concepts. You have, I mean, just the fact that we are in, in session number 122, I mean, it's a mockery on the scientific method as itself, you know? It's so fragmented, it's so complicated, uh, the entire model. Then you have the neglect of fundamental questions. I mean, all these fundamental questions on the table in 1930 are completely taken away. You don't know why we have protons and electrons. You don't know the mass ratio. You don't know the fine structure constant. You don't know gravity, and the standard model is useless for all these fundamental questions. There is a lot of historical ignorance, even if you're in your own field, how it developed in the 60s, in the 50s. And then there is this, there is always a signal illusion. You build, you build a collider, you have a signal, and then you remove the background, and what's, uh, what is remaining is declared as a new particle. You know? And all this insanity is uh, in the phrase, yesterday's Nobel Prize is today's background. No, you don't make independent confirmations, you don't make repeatable experiments in that sense. And this is, I think, how it works for 80 years. Then you have theoretical wishful thinking. There is the, these models who went off completely to the level of metaphoric concepts such as um, you operate instead in a, in a real space, you operate in a space of hypercharge and isospin on all these concepts. Well, then you have big parroting, the bigger the group, the bigger the group think, and you have the lack of transparency. I will come back to this. So, uh, there is no pile of crap you cannot scale up to an even bigger pile of crap. And that's what criticizes also Sabine Hossenfelder rightly. She says, particle physics continue empty promises. And here is one of these, Fabiola Gianotti. A good example for a guaranteed result is dark matter. A proton collider operating at energies around 100 tera electron volts will conclusively probe the existence of weakly interacting dark matter particles of thermal origin. This will lead to either a sensational discovery or an experimental exclusion that will profoundly influence both particle physics and astrophysics. And as Hossenfelder dryly remarks, no. This will just let physicists to swap their theories for new theories which predict higher energies for the new particles that have not been found, okay? And that's how it works for 80 years. I mean, you don't even have to change your convictions about the theories. Uh, there will be an, you will be retired because it takes nicely such a long time to build a new collider, but you don't have to you don't have to change your convictions about the energies. There will be a new generation of young prospective theoreticians that uh, have these theories. And uh, yeah, that's the way it works for decades. And uh, my message is that in that respect, high energy physics is a futile enterprise since about 1930. And it hasn't delivered a useful result for humanity so far. Well, apart from serendipitous discoveries like the internet, but you don't need particle physics to discover the internet, to invent the internet, to just hand out money to smart people and say, do whatever you want and you might get it. So, just be honest, uh, Hostenfelder complains about 
misleading the public here. I think this is a serious uh, allegation and just go and debate with Hasenfelder about this. So, uh, and refrain from these big claims. 20 billion atom smasher to unlock the secrets to find missing 95% of the universe. I mean, all this dark matter talk, I mean, listen to people who understand something about dark matter, like uh, Saunders, the astrophysicist. I don't read the quote because of the time, but uh, learn something about dark matter before you talk about. And here the thing is, this is not falsifiable. Physicists can always accommodate non-detection by inventing new possible dark matter candidates. Okay, uh, I don't want to rank too much here. I think all this is part of a bigger problem in science and in physics, and I addressed this in my book, Make Physics Great Again, America Has Failed. What we have is a complete change of scientific tradition from the, I would say, healthy, philosophically oriented physics in the first half of the 20th century, where people were interested in the deep questions of nature and deep problems. And then after the war, we had a technology-oriented applied physics, just doing bigger and bigger experiments, just scale up and without too profound thinking. And it's, it's best shown in the distinction of these two key conferences in 1927 at the Solvay conference, all the elite of physicists gathered and were discussing the most fundamental and basic problems and well, they failed because maybe it was too difficult, okay? But after the war, we had a complete disjoint set, both of physicists and the relevant topics. Physics was restarted with comparatively irrelevant questions and I mean, well, that's where modern theory started. And uh, you see this, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, of course, one big event was the atomic bomb. I, I think, I mean, it equally damaged humanity and physics. And so we have this complete, it, it's, it's become another science, you know? So I speed up. This was the foundation of quantum mechanics. I recommend reading Oliver Kahn's revelation of the missing foundations of this theory and everything is built upon there. You see Dirac's word, this is just not sensible mathematics. And there's nothing left to say about just that everything what you do in theory is built upon that. So don't get me wrong, I admire uh, your engineers, your technicians, you have my deepest respect, but that does not automatically make you science. Pushing technology to the limits is not automatically science. And well, now comes the constructive part of my talk. Uh, I think we're going to have an AI revolution, but what we absolutely need is the complete raw data. I think it's almost a scientific crime to throw away 99% of the data, do no triggering, publish all the raw data, publish your source code, repeat classic experiments, and uh, well, that's the way to go. Uh, I recommend this book, this book, and this book. <laughs> it's not my book, and here's my book, and this is my YouTube channel. Thank you very much. I really appreciated your patience. Before we come to the discussion, I'd like to ask the audience whether you're happy with the recording running. Is anybody against the recording? Okay, so I think we can leave it on then. So let's come to the questions. Where can we access the recording afterwards? Can we access the recording? It will be on my YouTube channel, yes. Okay, still happy? Okay, so more questions. So I'll, I'll start. So thank you very much for referencing our work. It's maybe a bit unfortunate that you apparently haven't been there before yesterday, because then maybe uh, the, the no use theorem and the concepts behind it would have been a little bit more clear, I hope at least. Um, and we had this example for the Large Shutter Collider, obviously, and there's a lot to read up about that, how it actually works. Uh, otherwise, I would like to know, what, why do you think these, these experiments in the 60s, which you reference, why would it be any difference if 
we did exactly that again what we okay. did with them. Okay, okay. First, I forgot to say, I mean, all this is not intended as a personal insult. Yeah, I should have mentioned this. And I know that all this is to be seen in the cultural uh, context. But uh, you're referring to your specific question. I mean, uh, we, we need public data. And uh, so far, no one outside this community can reasonably reproduce the experiments and reproducibility is a key element. So what one should do is repeat these key experiments, Gargamel, Hofstetter's experiments and so on, put all the raw data on the internet and let whoever likes to do that analyze. And I think it's key that, I mean, many people would argue if I doubt the concept of quarks, for example, oh, all this has been repeated so many times. No, not exactly, because the fact that you remove as background in the subsequent experiment means that you do not in independently test your original hypothesis. Yes. I, I, so I, obviously, I strongly disagree for good reasons, which we've been discussing here for uh, 122 sessions, I think, something like that. <laughs> but, um, I mean, as I said, the whole conference is very interesting. Maybe over time it will be more clear. Another question. I'm curious now. Yeah. So in the last slide you had a proposal for any untriggered data. Yeah? And now in your arguments again you asked to have access to all the data which is available. What about sustainability? If we all start to reproduce the data new and new and new again, what about energy yeah, which you will use up? Yeah? You destroy the environment, why bad? Yeah? If you would allow 7 billion of people to analyze the data, 7 billion times the computing power of CERN presently? Come well, on. I, I guess and furthermore, one more argument. Yeah? Untriggered data yeah? brings it back to the 30s of last century or to the 20s of last century when people looked at their eyes because they did not have the luminosity as we have today. So how do you want to write, for example, with Atlas untriggered data? Okay, okay. Thank you for the question. Well, I guess CERN has a, the energy bill of CERN is, is pretty high, but anyway, so, so far about sustainability. But yeah, the, that's the usual argument. How do you do that? If we would collect all the raw data, it would be a pile of DVODs reaching up to the top of the Mont Blanc. But the question. No, to the moon. <laughs> okay, I'm not up to date, evidently. <laughs> but I mean, who told you to go to that? giant absurdity in the first place to build machines where you cannot collect the data anymore and this with today's technology of storage devices yeah. that's the absurd thing you know <laughs> i mean just just uh, be sufficiently keep your data at in a, at the level that you can store because otherwise it doesn't make sense you throw away maybe the most interesting part because you fo narrowly focus on the pre uh, preconditions of your model. I mean, maybe we okay. can stop here just for time reasons, but thank you very much for that very good argument for untriggered running at the FCCEE, which is obviously... That's not the F. You cannot, I agree. Yes, we yeah. can. Uh, sorry, it's <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Much preferred over Make America Great Again, I would say. So, thank you very much. It was a pleasure.